It's Camden County Redevelopment Agency regular meeting August 5th, 2021. 9.05 a.m. Ernie Lee McGahey Government Building. Please turn your cell phone to vibrate silent or the all setting. The Board of County Commission allows any person to speak regarding an item on the agenda. Is there a proof of publication? Yes, this meeting has been properly published with Pensacola News Journal on July 31st, 2021. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Are there any speakers for public forum? No, sir. Thank you, Ms. Long. Technical and public service consent agenda. Thank, thank you. Good morning. The first is a recommendation concerning the Community Redevelopment Agency meeting minutes July 8, 2021 for your review and approval. Chair, accept the motion. We Second. Are, please vote. That passes unanimous. Thank you so much. Budget and finance. Okay. On the first recommendation um, under A, we do have a slight uh, amendment. Um, we're, we're striking. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Morrison's from the agenda, they requested to be removed. So there'll be, going forward, it'll be two residential rehab grant funding and lien agreements, and there's an A and B for your review and approval. Okay. I'll we'll move. accept the motion with the amendment. i move uh, motion A and B with the amendment uh, for only uh, Jones and Lee. Second. Second. Please vote. That passes unanimous, thank you. Okay, and our second uh, agenda is a recommendation concerning the residential roof program funding and lien agreements, and there's an A and B for your review and approval. Move item two A and B in the affirmative. Second. We have a motion and a second, please vote. That passes unanimous, thank you. Okay, and so the next item is discussion. Um, you wanted me to, um, re you requested us to bring back this status on the Community Housing Development Organization, the Chodo Project um, for infill housing for four lots um, that's in the city. So we received two responses for this RFP. Um, the county will be funding this project under the HUD Home Investment Partnership Program for this. Uh, and we are working with, we have worked with the city of Pensacola to remove 80 city code liens that was on some of these properties. Um, the committee have met and we um, selected Northwest Florida Community Housing Development Corporation to um, move forward with this project. Um, staff will be bringing an agreement back uh, at the next board meeting, August the 19th, to get this um, and also to donate. Uh, it will be an agreement along with a lot donation for your review and approval. And um, once we get the agreement, staff will meet with the agency to review and discuss the next steps. Um, city did warn us or just give us heads up that it is taking them about three to four weeks for permitting once we submit the site plan and everything is in compliance. That is taking them a little longer um, to provide the permitting for those. And we're moving forward once we get final approval from the, from the city once we submit site plans. And how, how many proposals did we have? How many what now? How many submittals did we have? There was two um, submittals, sir. Okay. How many do we typically get? On um, there's, it, there's not a lot of uh, certified CHOTOs out there. So, um, but that's all we received, though, was two. Okay. Yes, sir. I, mean, I hope in the future that when we're bringing forth something, it has at least three. Yes, sir. Bids. I mean, I, I, okay. For my support. Any more questions? All right. If there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Have a second. motion, second. All in favor? Unanimous. So adjourn, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Commander. All right. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is the agenda review for the August 5th uh, Board of County Commissioners regular meeting. Uh, Commissioner May, you have the invocation? Yes. We okay. have that covered. Stephen, you want to do the pledge? Yes. All right, um, are there any items to be added to the agenda, Madam Attorney? No. Nope. Stephen? No. Nope. Nope. No, sir, Mr. Chairman. I don't have uh, I'm just going to, I'm adding one. I'm going to piggyback a $1,000 contribution to the Cantonment football like I did last year. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything. 
Okay, that's fine. Um, commissioner's form, if, uh, are we okay just holding off till tonight? Yeah, I mean, and because I know that you got quite a few people yep. uh, that, that, to speak, and so I'm good with that. Mr. Okay. Um, but I, I would like to take this time to go ahead, and uh, I know Marie Mott's here, so if uh, we'll go ahead and hear, hear from Marie, I'm just updating our community, and I think we have a few others that, that want to talk on this. So and I think Sandra Smiley is in writing. I think Pastor Marcel Davis is. Oh, there he is, yeah. Okay. M M Mr. Chairman. Uh, in relation to the John Clarity thing, I think there are some things that are going to be happening right outside of our chambers at around 10, so I'll be exiting uh, to be a part of that at 10 o'clock. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Marie. Let's see if I can get this presentation up. So I've um, you know, reworked this a little bit since the last time you guys have seen me. Um, just a, a reminder, the Florida Health COVID-19 website is available for some information to the public. Uh, they publish a weekly report on Fridays, um, and there's also uh, locators on there for both testing and vaccines statewide. Um, there's also information available uh, through the CDC on their COVID data tracker website as well. Those are fairly easy to locate with a Google search for those terms. Um, Florida Health website address uh, is floridahealthcovid19.gov. Um, and then just to kind of a little bit of a review of cases uh, in Escambia County, these are from the weekly reports for June and July. And that one is just a cumulative positivity um, cases. And you can kind of see, you know, some shifting in there toward late July. Uh, this is a weekly report. So this is a little bit more um, kind of real time because it's just looking at the cases coming in on a weekly basis, not the cumulative since March of 2020. So, um, so you can kind of see the shift in the percent positivity over the two months, as well as the increase in cases on a weekly basis. Um, and then this is just another way of looking at that as a case rate or the number of new cases per 100,000 people of the population. So again, just another kind of indicator of increasing cases in the community. Um, the other thing that's going on or that's, in, that's you know, of useful information is vaccination in the community. Um, I've been very encouraged to see that going up. So um, you can kind of see again from June, um, having about 39% of the age eligible population vaccinated to the end of July, reaching close to 44% of the age eligible population. So that's 12 and up. Um, and again, going from just over, just under 110,000 to almost 124,000 people vaccinated in our county. Marie, can I ask a quick question about this slide? Does this mean fully vaccinated or are these, at, that 44% is that at least one shot? That's the, at least one shot. At least one shot. So do we have a number for the fully vaccinated two shot? I don't think I have that handy. I can see if I can get it. It's not far off. I, I appreciate um, that. It's not far off the mark, uh, but it is, you know, the, I think the important takeaway here is the consistency of uptake of vaccine. Um, I think also here's another kind of good way of looking at it. Um, again, the number of, of residents getting a shot per week has significantly increased, um, you know, from the beginning of June through the end of July. So, uh, so I kind of think, you know, just the, the key takeaways um, that we're trying to make sure what is happening is that we're encouraging vaccination in all eligible people. Um, we do have a campaign that we ran in the spring. We will be running that again. Um, and then assuring availability of access to vaccine for everybody. And uh, we do have a lot of partners vaccinating. Um, interestingly enough, I think I was generally seeing um, weekends being kind of a time for vaccination. So I think people must be going to pharmacies, Walmart, Publix, CVS, Winn-Dixie, those kind of places on the weekend to get vaccinated. There's really no way to kind of tease that out, but, um, but uh, that is available. I know Community Health um, is standing up the Brownsville site again for vaccinations 
and uh, we are offering it five days a week in the health department on a walk-in basis as well as doing outreach events and trying to work with partners to uh, come to them if that's something that will be effective. May I ask, oh. No, go ahead, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just going to ask you, um, the rapid test uh, kits, I, it's my understanding that those are maybe, there's a supply constriction. Is, is, is that the case, or are there, is there a plentiful supply of these rapid test kits for the health uh, clinics? Uh, I really don't have information on this specifics on supply on that. I haven't heard of anything locally in the health department of having issues getting them. Okay. Um, there are several kinds of rapid testing supplies. So the ones that, that we look at or have had in stock are the antigen tests. Um, there are some partners who are doing rapid PCR tests. So yes. there may be, that may be where there are issues, but I have that's, not heard I, that. I think that's the one because okay. you get your results back very quickly. Um, and, and I understand um, Ascension Medical is standing up some Abbott testing machines around the county, or really around the Panhandle, but including the county. Um, and Community Health is doing testing again at Brownsville three days a week. Uh, we are doing testing at the health department um, the days that Community Health is not doing testing at Brownsville, so there's a five-day week capacity to get testing. Ours is not rapid. It is a two- to three-day turnaround. And, and, and if I might, the, um, a lot of folks are concerned about this breakthrough infections uh, rate, and we, we now we're tracking the hospitalizations. We've seen a dramatic increase in hospitalizations, and we hear anecdotally that it's primarily uh, a high percentage of those are those who are unvaccinated, but just wondering if the health department is tracking those like myself, who've received both the shots, the Moderna, um, who are getting this infection on, in a breakthrough way. Is the local health department tracking that? And do you have information on that? <clears throat> the, the information that I have is, is statewide, because mm -hmm. um, everything goes through the statewide epidemiology system um, and is actually quality checked through the CDC as well. So uh, statewide, um, the, the breakthrough rate is about 6%. So what we're seeing really is about 94% of cases statewide mm -hmm. being unvaccinated individuals. Um, generally speaking, from what I'm getting reports from the hospitals and, and you know, kind of informal information, that is pretty consistent with what we're seeing locally. So that is kind of the key message is that it is very important to get vaccinated. It and does help. Among the breakthrough cases, and I'm sorry, to, to, but I want to drill down on this because this these are the questions that never get answered in the nightly news, right? And they just kind of hang in the breeze. Of those who are getting the breakthrough infections, the 6% that you say, how many of those are under 50, folks under 50? Is that, is that a number that we need to work? As schools start to ramp up to go back to school, we hear a lot of different things, but um, are the breakthrough infections coming to those who are already immunocompromised or uh, elderly? And do you have that broken down? I don't have that broken down. I can tell you that, again, statewide, the, the majority of cases are in the kind of 20 to 49 age range. Okay. So that is somewhat of an answer. Yeah. Um, and then if you're looking at 94% of those people are unvaccinated, um, because 94% of Florida cases are unvaccinated, sure. then, then- But that wouldn't give me the answer I'm looking for. I'm looking specifically at the 6% where we're having breakthroughs. You know, what's the what's the age demographics on a pie chart of that 6%? Does no one looking at that? Because that's an important thing to look at. Yeah, I can see if I can find that too. I, I appreciate it, uh, Lumen. And, and Lumen, thank you very much for bringing Marie today. Appreciate it. Um, you know, Jeff, I think. Well, I'm sorry. I just I, I watch the news and I want to get these. I want to get the specific questions answered that I never hear on the news. So we hear people with a concerned look, but they never answer the important questions. So, Jeff, I, I was talking with, with Sacred yesterday. They're setting up um, 60 rapid machines yeah. in the area. Um, and um, and then so they I, I know they're they're widely available. Um, I've asked him if he's having any supply issues and I haven't heard back yet. So okay. I'll let you know. Um, I know that. You know, sometimes the uh, I would I would agree that <clears throat> from what we've heard that locally we're seeing the the 90 to plus you know uh, uh, rate of infection for the, those being non uh, unvaccinated right. um, and I think of all ages, of all ages. Um, and I, I think um, I'm more familiar with a case where um, it was someone who was uh, receiving chemotherapy that had gotten the vaccine. Um, but in the, yeah, I mean, and so, um, but again, very light symptoms, um, not, 
which is which is good, and I think that's what we're we're seeing. And then Marie, I don't know if you can somewhat discuss this, but um, the the likelihood of of even though he was he received it or, or had COVID and received a vaccine, the likelihood of him passing it on to someone else who had also received the vaccine was was low. Is that is that an accurate statement from what we're seeing? I mean, you know. Generally, vaccine benefits include, you know, reducing your risk of contracting it and having severe symptoms, um, also minimizing the risk of spread. So it, it kind of works at, at multiple levels. Um, so again, just underscoring the importance of as many people getting vaccinated as possible. This is something we didn't have this time last year, you know. The vaccine. Yeah, last year all we had was prevention. That's right, social distancing. Sure. So, uh, I, I'm not to put you on the spot, but if, if there's any way that you could check that 6%, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about that and very interested. And then the final question I would ask is the number of deaths among those breakthroughs that have been fully vaccinated. If you could pull together those stats and email them to us, I would like to put that information out because I think that's very important information. A lot of people get sp spun out spun up looking at the case numbers, case numbers, but I think if you drill it down uh, and find what's really happening among those who are vaccinated, obviously unvaccinated, all bets are often, it's, but among those who are vaccinated, I think if we drill down on those numbers, we may be able to eliminate some of the uh, hysteria. Let's just use that word uh, that you see. Um, Jeff. Yeah. And, and Mr. Gilmore may be able to come up and help answer Maria. I know the mayor put out that in his meeting, and Robert, maybe you were part, I know I'm not a part of the hospital call, yeah, I'm on but that. you are, but that 96% of the positives in the hospital, 92% were unvaccinated. She said 94. 94. Well, that's statewide, and, and I think that. Um, what about local? I, uh, we're, we're close to that. I think they don't want to give an actual number just because it can fluctuate so much during the day, but, but I would say that we're seeing similar numbers in our hospitals. Well, Robert, I guess, and this is for my two colleagues that are here, because we're not on the phone calls that you're on with the healthcare officials. Are hospitalizations up? I mean, where, where I know you get that information, Eric, and you send it out. Where are we trending with hospitalizations? And we've, we've actually added that back to the website also. Yeah, it's, we're headed back. yeah. It's, it's back on the dashboard now, so we're, we're tracking that daily. Um, so Monday where are we? In, what are we're, we're increasing. We was at 240-something yesterday. We was at... Uh, I uh, 236. 236 the day before today I hadn't got the uh, so all three hospitals submit their numbers to us and then we put them into the uh, dashboard and I have I have not received Baptists today but I will tell you that both West Florida and Sacred Heart have increased from yesterday well I know I talked to Jules this morning uh, and I, I think there is I, I did not talk to Mr. Faulkner at all but I did talk to Kendrick Dodge at West Florida hospitals are beginning to be alarmed and concerned at this point is that kind of what you're getting from them they are concerned that the trend continues up that you know they're, we're not at where we was peak last uh, this time last time when we did this exercise but they're but the data is showing that this thing's going up they are they are getting a little concerned there if you look they've already started taking precautions at the hospitals limiting visitors uh, limiting what they do internally I don't know if they're going to do elective surgeries or not or scale that back that's going to be their decision I haven't heard that yet but I mean they are starting to do things to uh, preemptively get ready for a, a, a surge more or less are we able to give out local data without going through the governor eric or, or yeah we can it's just that uh some the hospitals it's, it's their information to give and they do share it with us on the call as far as a a ballpark and kind of give us an idea but they do give us the inpatients daily of what they see in the so hospitals. have we had any deaths in the last few months uh the last few months we've had some deaths yes sir from COVID. i, I don't know vaccinated unvaccinated i don't know that that number but but we I mean, have had COVID deaths yes sir we are we, where are those being reported uh, that is on the state weekly update on the PDF that is also linked to on our website that you can go pull the state information. Are we just pulling it out, though, for Escambia County? For we that? haven't pulled it out. I mean, we don't have it on our dashboard or anything right now. The state dashboard. And the reason I say that, Jeff, because Broward and Escambia are just two different counties. And I, I would rather see real-time local data abstracted uh, from, you know, somewhat confusing right. state data uh, that you have to disseminate through to figure it out. Right. So, I mean, can we do that, Eric? To, yeah, for, we, for us we to, can absolutely look at doing that, yes, sir. And what about the pediatric? How many, and, you know, as Jeff said, we're all watching news. I mean, depends on what channel. So what's our 
pediatric data and break out because our kids are getting ready to go to school. I mean, we're dealing with youth sports, right. youth football, which is a concern of mine. And if we don't have the pediatric data, I don't know how we're going to talk about after school programs and at least make good recommendations to our school board. So I, have we I pulled don't. out that pediatric data. I don't have that data. Is that in the state? No. Uh, I do know that our hospital said the median age was 45 for our area uh, of COVID inpatients. So that's what that's, we're seeing. That's all. That's, that's primarily unvaccinated. For, yeah, because it's in the uh, high 90s of the unvaccinated is what they were saying, or uh, low, it was like 94% is what they estimated unvaccinated in the hospitals right now, locally. So, so I mean, I'm sorry, Jeff. I, I was just going to say, you, we keep putting those numbers out and your vaccinations will continue to go up, yeah. right? I mean, I want real, true right now, empirical data. Yeah. I mean, I mean and, you know, a part of it, Eric or Marie, maybe you can, I mean, the, the, the concern, and I've talked to a lot of youth sports people and, and a lot of teachers, there's a lot, there, there is a high alert of teachers, particularly, you know, daycare teachers who, oh, are, no, absolutely. who are really afraid. And so how do we pull out that pediatric data? Uh, are we going to be able to do contact tracing? Particularly, are we prepared for that when schools start on how, how are we going to do that contact tracing uh, with children who are participating in, in school programs and daycare programs and after school programs? We, we have epidemiologists on staff that work with um, the school districts or whatever type of, of child organization staff that is to help them um, with contact tracing questions, issues, um, education that's needed for parents, um, those type of issues. So we will be able, and, and just, and, and thanks Maria, for, you're doing a great job. I passed by Gregory this morning, cars were already wrapped around before we got here. <laughs> Reminded me of Miss Smiley at Brownsville all week. Uh, so you're doing a great job and thank you. I know you're working extra hours. Uh, but is there anything that we can do to give uh, parents a level of comfort in terms of the pediatric data uh, as they're preparing? I mean, they're having to make some real hard choices or whether they homeschool or virtual school or go to school. And you just said, I know that we have information coming from the state, but is there anything locally we're going to be able to give so parents can look at that dashboard to make informed decisions, no matter what it is, but to be able to make an uh, educated, uh, informed decision? Um, I mean, the pediatric data is what I'm, for me, I'm most concerned about the pediatric data. I mean, because we're going to be, you know, a few days, Jeff, we're going to be putting a lot of children on a lot of buses and a lot of schools. Uh, and obviously we don't have a mask mandate, and, and but we certainly should give as much information as we can to parents. And that's what I'm trying to dig down on, Marie, and seeing can Eric help or can we help to get that information out locally? And I think the superintendent, I had a meeting with the superintendent uh, yesterday, it was not on this, but uh, I, I know that he wants any help that he can get. And I know they're looking at protocols as well. Right. And, and you know, we've, we have conversations with Martha Hanna and the superintendent about what we can do, how we can help um, educate. And, you know, we can certainly partner to do any type of community education on that as possible. I certainly encourage all parents to have conversations with their physicians if they have very specific concerns that are related to medical issues. Um, you know, and parents can um, work with their kids to kind of teach them prevention measures if they're not old enough to get vaccinated. Um, my kids wear masks when they go to schools or camps. Um, and we talk about hand washing and, you know, making sure they're not in too close contact with people within reason. So. Um, so we you know, try to balance the need for good quality education with good prevention and, and protection. Well, do you think that we're about at the peak now, Maria? Do you think we um, think I wish I could tell you that. No. I, wish, yeah. I know I'm just know. concerned about some of the school and so, some of the programs that we're running. So, you know, we're, we're not going to know we've hit the peak until we've hit the peak mm -hmm. and we have the data behind us. So. So is there, any, and I know you said we can do a lot of these preventive things in, in, in terms of masks and social distancing, washing hands and our sports programs in our schools. Um, do, but do you think that we'd be able to, Eric could be able to abstract any data, I mean, on positives and things that we have locally, or particularly uh, with our young people? I wish I could answer that too. I'm, not, I'm just not, I'm not sure exactly what data you might be looking for or what, what would be available. Positives. Um, Contact tracing, so, uh, trends. So I can I can see what I can find out. Hot spots. So, that's you know. Yeah. I mean, if if Montclair is a hot spot and there are 40 kids, I mean, I think that that would be good information to know. But thanks, Marie. Thanks, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Marie, can I ask you another question? Because I, I have my mask here too, and I'm 
where I work now, we have to wear these all the time, whether or not we're vaccinated. And of course I do it because I follow rules. But uh, the other <laughs> thing that I've heard in the media um, uh, is this, uh, and apparently it's baked, ba backed with some sort of scientific study. So I was going to ask your opinion about it, that someone like me who's fully vaccinated both shots um, and who might have COVID be a carrier perhaps could transmit it through something in his nose. And that that's why even though you're vaccinated and you're asymptomatic that you have to wear a mask. Is, is there a scientific study that I've not been able to find online? Because I've looked uh, that shows that, a rigorous scientific study that shows someone who is asymptomatic, fully vaccinated, should wear a mask, and there's effic efficacy to that to prevent him from spreading the disease. Because I haven't found it, and I just, I'd like to know, I'd like to read it if, if there is, if that's out there. You know, what I can tell you right now is that the CDC is currently recommending masks for people. I know, I know in, that they indoor are. Indoor public I, I hear, I hear the breathless, I hear the breathless news uh, figures mm -hmm. and as they're very concerned looking into the camera. But, but I always it, like to look at the data. And when it comes to data, I think everything is still very new. I mean, we've, we've been in this for what seems like a long time to us, mm -hmm. but from an epidemiological um, perspective, it is still very novel and the data is still unfolding. And so I think we're going to be hearing things like this as they come up until it can be curated have you, and have looked you, at has, it. No, has no one else asked you that? Because it, to me, that's a, a lot of businesses are struggling with this. Do I make people wear masks? Because, you know, we were all told once we were vaccinated that, you know, this would eliminate the masks. But now we're told it's backed with science. I mean, that's, that's what the guy on TV says each night when he comes on the air. Are you, but are you aware of that study? Is there a study that you've seen that, that backs this up, this contention? Because if so, I mean, could you look for that? Oh, would you mind? Yeah. I mean, you're in the business. I'm not. But I would love to read that study, and hopefully it was rigorous and uh, reviewed. Commissioner May, just on something you said earlier, and I think some of the things that we heard from our colleagues through floor association accounts and such was, and I, I don't know if we can confirm this, but of the deaths that some of these counties had seen, uh -huh. zero had been vaccinated. That's, that's why. That, yeah, yeah, that's percent. why. Right. You know, I mean, that's the... I don't know if I have the scientific, but I keep hearing the same thing. That's what well, you know. Yeah, so, I keep hearing. Um, anyway. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I keep uh, hearing. Anecdotally, that's what they've been. Uh, I heard that from a number of them for regarding their county. So I don't know if we can say the same for ours, but um, I don't, yeah. I mean, we hear a lot. It's not I true. Think I, I, I think I remember hearing one hospital comment on that, and that was the comment they made as well. Yeah. But okay, so we may be seeing that locally. We may be seeing that locally as well. Right. But even if it's not 100 percent true overwhelmingly well, we're not seeing uh, the deaths with vaccinated people and that's i like where commissioner mcgosh was going i mean let's put the data of how many deaths from people who have gotten the vaccine versus yeah i mean if that's and you illustrate that data people are going to go get vaccinated i believe it i mean i'm not an anti-vaxxer I, I have the vaccine <laughs> but when you're talking about death and and you you conflate everything together you create this hysteria there are people that were very responsible and as soon as they were able they went out and got the shot you know, there are others who have different belief systems, but, um, you know, that's why it's very critical of that 6%. I want to know of that 6%, I'd love a, a pie chart, the ages, and right. then another one that shows their health status, whether or not they're immunocompromised, chemotherapy patient, because I, you know, I think when you do that, you're going to find, like Robert just said, there's very few deaths, if any, and the majority of the folks who are getting it, the breakthroughs are probably, you know, immunocompromised or elderly, or there's some other comorbidity. That's the data that I six percent. So that and that study that shows that I should be wearing this fully vaccinated because I might give it to someone even if I don't have it. Mm. Sure. Jeff, I mean, yeah, I don't have any data to suggest, but I guarantee you I've gone to twenty funerals of people who've died from COVID. Were they vaccinated? Uh, no, and this was you know last time. And I said, yeah, I've not gone to any deaths of anybody that was vaccinated yeah. that I've known of. I mean, I've just not gone to any, any deaths, but. I mean, I'd rather for the science to speak than for me just to have my That's opinion. Sure. Right. I mean, I don't know. Um, Maria, do you? Is there another surge? I mean, a, a monkeypox or something? Is there, are we hearing that there's another thread or strand of, of, of COVID that's about that's in Florida that's not really being talked about in the media? Are y'all hearing anything from the your? I've got maybe the Colombian in Brazil. I mean, a, a monkeypox or I'm, I'm hearing. It. Have you heard anything? Any? Is there anything out there that we? Uh, about not. a Florida variant or a new variant? Yeah. I, I mean, 
Something other than Delta is, is, I think, probably what you're at. You yeah, that's a good. We, we're aware of there, Delta, but there. Yeah, there are. Yeah, several, thank you, you know, There are several you. variants of concern um, that you know I think we've heard about over the last several months. But um, you know, looking at the CDC's data, you can see in the southeast region, Delta is the predominant variant. Um, that's that's the best information that's available on variants at a population level. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I mean, Jeff, regardless of what we say, we are in some difficult days. Oh, and this thing is very dangerous. Yes. And I mean, as a county and, and, and as the ham of, of leadership, I mean, we have to get the messaging out. I mean, you know, people can say, well, we haven't had many deaths as we had before. I mean, but people are still getting sick. Oh, I, I mean, the hospitals are filling up daily. I mean, some people are, are not doing elective surgeries. And so if we're filling hospital rooms up and someone's having a mild stroke and they can't get in, that mild stroke becomes a major stroke and, and then they have a heart attack. And, I agree and with then you. they die. I mean, there's multiplying multiple factors that contribute uh, to not only people who are getting COVID, but to other citizens as well. That's why it's I mean, important for us to have these discussions right. just like this. And, and I think even if it's not COVID, in, in hearing from Dr. Oleski, our medical examiner, I mean, the longer this drags out, the, the bigger her caseload mm -hmm. in, in her shop, which is not a good thing. I mean, she, she reported we're up like 70% in drug overdoses and deaths. I mean, it's just really, and these are these, you know, these things that are happening outside of COVID. Right. And if we don't take precautionary measures, then shame on us. And, yeah, I so. mean, and there are difficult times, and there are uncomfortable times. Uh, but, I, but I think data is important, and, I, and whether or not you agree with you know, the approach the CDC takes or the approach Florida takes, I think people get um, suspicious when the data suddenly stops be flowing, right? And so I'm glad Eric is putting it back on the dashboard, I, I think, but I think we need complete data. And complete data to me is we've been giving vaccinations out for a while now. Um, I think it's pretty widely known that they're very effective, right? Um, so if we focus in on the people uh, who have been vaccinated and, and, and their outcomes, I think you'll find a lot more people will be encouraged to get right. vaccinated. And by the same token, you take the 94% who are having all the problems now, because it is primarily people that are not vaccinated, mm -hmm. and you show their outcomes. And I think those two things together, side by side, the data will be your best salesman for getting people vaccinated. So if, if Marie, if, if there's any way you can find that data for us and email it to us, I'll do everything I can to get it out. Sure. And, and it's a proper uh, education job. If I'm sitting six feet apart, I mean, I don't necessarily have to wear the mask, but if I walk up on you, I'm going to put on the mask. Okay. But, you know, you and I may have different opinions, but it's all based on our own experiences. And I agree with you. Put the data out and make your own decision. Exactly. Make your own decision on, on whatever you want to do. That's and, and the frustration is there's a lot of half-truths out there, though. So, you know, people say, well, yeah, there's a study. You should do it. Well, now, wait a minute. And then they don't show you the study. I, w I want to see the study that shows that if I've been vaccinated and I'm not sick, that I can somehow give you COVID. I want to see that study. No one's been able to show it to me. So that's why I'm asking people like you. I'd like to see it. Because there's a lot of people that believe that. How many deaths have we had in the last month or two since the second uptick here? I don't, I don't have that, sorry. How can we get that? I mean, we were reporting that last spring, correct? Yeah, was that? I mean, I know that the like how to report deaths. I mean, that's not something they can have. Um, the CDC's website has deaths on their COVID data tracker, uh, and right. I do know that Florida's has not been updated. Um, I, I don't know why. And I know you you have constraints from the state. From you have constraints from the state, Maria, and, and I certainly understand. Eric, we don't have constraints. Uh, people are dying locally in our hospitals. I mean, that's, I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. A question that should be able to be answered, you know, quickly. I mean, how many deaths have we had? If there are none, if there are zero, then there are zero. Great. People are just getting sick. There are no deaths. If there's right. 10, if there's 15, I, I, I think mean, but the, we need the to delay will be is determining was it COVID or was it not, and I don't know if the hospitals are making that determination. So let me <laughs> run down that path and see if I can get a true well, definition let me do of COVID. How many people died who had COVID then? Right. That'll let me, be, let me if, run if, down if they want to get that technical. That, I mean, they reported it last time, and they were able to infiltrate well, that, between. That was a state report, that. and we was pulling it straight from the state data, but the state has quit reporting that, so... But let me work with our community partners. I'll give, come back with an answer for you guys of what we can and can't do and try to get these numbers. And, and I okay. know that that, I mean, that is what he said, a typical reason in the lag in data, death data reporting is, is validating the cause versus. Because if you remember last time, we would get like 25 deaths in a hit because they've evaluated all the ones previously last month and put them all on that day. So, that, you know. And Jeff, that's why people get suspicious. So if you're giving out data and people want to know the deaths and you can't report it, uh, I, people, people, it's a problem. Yeah. And so, I mean, we can't control the state. All we can do no. is control what we do locally. And, and we can't control the 
federal government. And I've got to give Eric a lot of credit and this board as well. I mean, when in the, in the thick of it all, you know, last year, one of the things I wanted was I wanted to see the people who had recovered because that was data that was not being tracked yeah. by the state for some weird reason I'll never understand. And we did it locally. We were tracking that. And I'm proud of the fact that we were because I think people wanted to know that. But my counterpart to my right, Lumen, makes a very good point. The hospitals, obviously, it's a hospital. People get sick. People die every day. I mean, I know that they're tracking those patients that have COVID. There's federal reimbursements that come along with that. There's a lot of money out there for it, right? So when folks die that have COVID, in the hospital, that should be possibly something that we could get without violating HIPAA or anything like that, and just directory information, right? I'll work with the partners. Well, I'll yeah. find out. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that and, Wednesday, and, too, and, on the coffee. And, yeah. Yeah. and Jeff, all I'm saying, that, that data is available because when someone dies of COVID, is. they can get $9,000 for their burial. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so it has to be tracked. Someone knows. Yeah, so, so, no, so I think so what Lewin wants to know, what I want to know is how many people a week are dying of COVID in Pensacola, Florida? Okay. Yeah. Easy. Easy. Let us know. Okay. And then and l let's look at that on a bar uh, graph, and you know, and then we'll will be satisfied. No, okay. All right, so Lemon, you want to hear from Chandra and Marcel? Yes, yes. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Eric. Chandra and Mar Marcel. Good morning. I think we just want to hear a little bit about what you guys are doing. Okay, um, so Community Health uh, this past week stood back up uh, mobile testing at Brownsville. We're doing it Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 9 to 1, and at the same time, we're also offering a vaccine uh, clinic at Brownsville. So we're doing uh, rapid testing, which is by appointment for individuals who have symptoms and then we're also doing send outs for those that feel that they've had some sort of exposure but are not experiencing any symptoms. I can tell you um, in the two weeks prior to, we did about 260, or, or about 213 tests just throughout our entire organization and about 116 vaccines. In two days just at Brownsville, not counting what we've done throughout our clinics, we've pretty much doubled that. So we've done about 265 tests in total. Our um, positivity rate on rapids alone, we're still getting our send outs back in, is about 27%. And we've done about 183 vaccines at those, um, during those two days. And again, it doesn't count what we're doing throughout our entire system. When you say 27%, Ms. Smiley, how does that compare to this time last year when we were in the peak? It's pretty similar. Pretty soon. Yeah, we were in the 20s. Now, again, this is just on our rapids. So two weeks ago, our rapids, we were testing at about 17% positive. And again, these are people who are coming in um, with symptoms, and it's highly likely that uh, they've had some sort of exposure. So, so you when you say 27% to a, like a lay person or someone that's watching, what does that mean that 27% is that relatively high, low? alert I mean well when we were at this place last year um, and we were seeing high uh, positive rates throughout our community we were experiencing 25 plus percent and like when you said that you're doing 265 tests what we doing I mean I, in Brownsville's packed I mean thank you for what you're doing I mean I, you can't even drive there I mean so you, I mean kudos to you and your staff um, so 265 is that like was that high or Compared to last year when we first uh, it, It's about average on what we were doing in drive through testing last year. I think we're going to need to look at ways in which we can offer more. Our, our COVID um, call line, 10 days ago, we were averaging about 20 calls a day. We're exceeding 200 calls a day right now. Wow. So, so you went from 20 to 200. Mm -hmm. cool. um, oh. Additionally, I've got uh, going into this second surge, if you will. Um, I was going in with some staffing concerns just that everybody was experiencing. So my staff is stretched. I'm pulling staff um, to have them support vaccine clinics to support drive through testing. So uh, I am looking at um, ways in which we can alter our maybe service times for just in our clinics, converting our, our visits to virtual visits. I've sent staff home that can work remotely. So we are kind of ramping back up to that level of COVID protocols that we had last year. And I don't know if you can speak to this, but I, I've talked, spoken with some healthcare friends all week. Uh, 
even staff people, uh, it seems like the positives are up uh, this time higher with staffing than it was last time. I mean, are you seeing that trend as well? That the that the, the po positives of, of the COVID for the employees who are w working, that the positives are up within the healthcare world. Yes, we have in the past um, week and a half, um, we've experienced 15 um, positives, and these are um, uh, clinical staff. So when we have already wow. gone into a shortage, and then we're pulling staff to help support these testing and vaccine clinics, and then now we've got staff that are going to have to be out for two weeks, um, you know, you can see it, it creates some concerns in service deliveries. Rob, that's one of the concerns, I mean, and, and Steve and, and Jim, that even maybe if people are, are not dying at the rate that they were dying last time, it's certainly taking resources when uh, small organizations having to send home 15 people. Imagine what large health care providers are having to send home with their employees, and that's less boots on the ground that's able to, to help people. So uh, to me, that's why it's a big problem. I mean, it's, so, thank you. I mean, I'm excited about being out Saturday with you as well. Yes. I, mean, I think it was a great idea. Um, so I'll take this moment to plug that we'll be at Brownsville and uh, giving away school supplies, book supplies, and getting vaccinated at the same time. So thank you and, and, and Ms. Donaldson and your staff for uh, allowing us to partner with you on that. All right. Thank you. Marcel, you have anything to Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, as an outreach coordinator for this, since we've been working with Commissioner May and Community Health Northwest Florida since January uh, to get people vaccinated. And I know the commissioner, gosh, has some great questions, but there is one data that we're sure of that the vaccinations has been effective. Yes. And so really as a county, you know, we should be educating people. We can't push people to get vaccinated, but we can educate them on the vaccines and getting vaccinated. And what you have is, as we've been going door to door, uh, we've been featured on, on ABC World News Tonight. I did a piece in Mobile with CNN, was up in Montgomery doing door to door. What we found out is that overcoming that misinformation has caused people to want to get vaccinated. On yesterday with Community Health Northwest Florida, we actually vaccinated two people that had blogs, that had uh, Facebook lives that they talked about not getting vaccinated. Both of them were vaccinated yesterday. So I'm here today to just tell you guys, thank you for holding the county together through this stressful situation. But we should, we should as a county stand up and educate and do more outreach to people to get vaccinated. And so I wear my American flag because if we're going to keep America great, we must vaccinate. And it is. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. Oh, man. Wow. That's pretty good. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, how you in, how you in PIO, buddy? Absolutely, man. So it, it is imperative. Marcel, say that again. What was that? I'm going to hear that again. We're going to keep America great. We must vaccinate. Yeah. So it, 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 is, wow. it, it is a situation where. You know where he votes. You know, yeah. We, we talk about the mask, and, and I am a mask wearer, but I think that it's time to let people understand that, you know, the mask is just preventative, but you can get vaccinated and you can live. Do I know people who have died with the COVID virus recently? Yes. I know 13 people who have died with the COVID, and they've all been middle-aged, they have not been old, who have died. This information might not be coming out, but as a pastor, I'm going to do eulogies. And the reason why I'm going to do eulogies is because these people have passed because of this virus. You have people that they're putting a strain on our system because they're uninsured. And the cost of caring for a person that's uninsured going is a big strain. If you have a loved one that needs a surgery, but the surgery has to be stopped because now we're back into this spin of overpopulating our hospitals, having this, you know, it's kind of cynical. So that's why I want to encourage this county, if there's any more outreach that we can do, if there's any more funding that we can have to have boots on the ground. I have lieutenants who have worked, and I want to thank Community Health Northwest Florida. They were very instrumental. Even if you were old and, and you were in a wheelchair, we were able to get you in in Brownsville and get you vaccinated really quick. So I'm here this morning just to encourage the commissioners to take a stance on doing some outreach, not pushing that you have to be vaccinated, but educating our citizens of there is a data fact 
that if we're vaccinated, we can't live. Marcel, I want to thank you for the outreach that you're doing. I saw the piece with you and Commissioner May on ABC. My son from Milwaukee called me and said, hey, Pensacola's in the news. And I turned it on. I saw Lumen May on ABC World News. So thanks for doing that. But let me ask you in your For COVID, yeah. For COVID. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you've been to Mobile here. You've done a lot of outreach, <laughs> Montgomery. What is the hesitance from the folks that you're seeing in your community? What is the hesitance um, to, to the vaccine? Okay, the hesitancy that I'm seeing in the community is that when the vaccination first came out, people went back years to want to talk about the Tuskegee experiment. Okay. okay. Huh. And so it, it kind of frightened some people. Then there was a lot of information given out that, that it was going to affect the minority community really, really hard. And as we see, we're all citizens, but now it's really affecting all of our citizens and really middle aged white America is really being affected really hard. Yeah. So the hesitancy was that. So how we overcame that is that there's a piece on MSNBC about a young African American female from a small town in Carolina who helped develop this vaccine over the weekend. So over a weekend period, but that science come from them doing work on the SARS vaccine. So it's all kinds of technology out there already. So they put these formulas together and they came up with this vaccine that we're now using now that has been effective. But when you have misinformation that's coming on the radio, uh, you've got a lot of woke people on Facebook who are telling you information. Uh, we even have the Nation of Islam has put out much information saying, do not get vaccinated. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You said the Nation of Islam? The Nation of Islam. Has put out information. Put out much saying information saying, do not get vaccinated. Okay. That this va wow, yes. I, I hadn't so heard you that. Have, you have wow. to overcome stuff like that when you're going door to door to talk to people and really have information of how this has worked. And then you have to be honest, and, and I say this, this too, to you too, is that love your neighbor. <clears throat> and who's your neighbor? Okay, it's the people you work with around you. If you've been vaccinated, talk about it. As you see Senator Graham, what's the first thing he said was, thank God I was vaccinated because my symptoms would be worse. Okay, so it's very important for us to start having conversations with people that we love about the effect of this and how it has been. It is the one proven data that if you're vaccinated, you could live. Even if you get the, the virus, then your symptoms are minimum and you can live through this. But people who have not been vaccinated have found themselves in a very um, bad situation. I know another man who he lived through it, but now he's still on an oxygen tank. And this was a person that I talked to over and over again about getting vaccinated. And finally, he got the virus, but now he's walking around with oxygen tank. So it's putting a lot of pressure on a lot of things in healthcare. And a lot of these people are uninsured that are catching virus, and that cost is going to be passed on to all of us. Thanks. Jeff, and I think that's a good point. And Sandra probably could talk about that uninsured care and that people are going to the hospital with COVID. I mean, typically, young people, they don't have insurance. Indirectly, we pay for that. Absolutely. I mean, Medicare, Medicaid, yes. uh, us helping to fund the things that community health that she does. And so, to me, that you know, those are some of the variables that don't get discussed. I mean, it's going to be a 20-year financial burden on the health care system uh, with a lot of this uninsured care and we can't we can't get there's not too many more recovery acts or, or rescue acts or, or at some point there's no more money to, to go get well, well there already isn't right yeah exactly well, Marshall thank you for thank your you. for your work and sure. I know you and all the pastors I was there with Miss Miley and uh, Miss Donaldson and all of the pastors and uh, you guys have relentless gone without pay without money uh, but to save souls and save people so I'm glad I mean I guess y'all had 10 or 15 pastors there uh, and I was glad to be a part of it so if you convey my thanks to all of those pastors who have joined our team I'd appreciate it okay it's worth the work thank you thank and you Marcel if you can just state y'all's name for the record real quick uh, Marcel Davis, 4093 Cobia Street, Pensacola, Florida. All right, thank you. Uh, Need Sandra to state hers? You got Sandra? Yeah, okay, yeah, she's got it. Sandra, thank Sandra, is there anything we can do to help uh, from the county perspective? Have you been our public health partner? I think just standing in um, in unison with your health care partners on messaging about the importance of the vaccine and, and um, keeping each other safe. All right, cool. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing. You got a great staff.
And Rob, I know we went far, but I hope that maybe Debbie could sit down with our PIO that we can aggressively do our part on properly getting the information out. I mean, to our after school programs, our sports programs, uh, we should go l let everyone know the dangers of what they're doing. So thanks, Debbie. All right, uh, written communication. Uh, Commissioner May, this is in both of our districts. And I know I see them, uh, so it looks like they're here. What is it, Robert? I'm sorry. Madam Attorney, you wanna? This attempt? is a little more, it's more convoluted than the usual one, and I know Mr. Hoffman, who's representing the uh, the owner, is here. Um, do you want me to try to walk through Are this? Are you working with us, sure. Robert? I didn't know about it until this week, so. Okay. Go, yeah, if you wanna. All right, I'll try. The 78, so they are asking for relief in order to ensure crystal clear title with regards to two properties. One is 7822 North Davis and one is 436 Beverly Parkway. The Davis Highway property is in District 4. The Beverly Parkway property is in District 3. The lien that is in question is associated with the 7822 North Davis Highway property. It stems from March of 2006. The special magistrate gave the owner at the time a week to resolve the issues. They were not resolved. A $500 per day fine commenced and ran for several weeks in, in, in the end, creating a $75,000 fine. The problems at that property were eventually abated by the county for a county abatement of $3,206. At the time that all of this happened, the owner of the Davis Highway property was an LLC known as REPDC. REPDC subsequently lost the property in a foreclosure and a different LLC known as ALT uh, became the owner of the property. It is unclear, and we were not able to reach a crystal clear decision on whether or not the foreclosure did or did not foreclose the county's lien. It didn't specifically name it, so arguably it's still there. Arguably, everything was foreclosed. It's not, it's not clear. But ALT becomes the owner. In February of 07, a different LLC known as NMT acquired title to 436 Beverly Parkway, and they acquired that property from REPDC, the original owner of the Davis Highway property. Those two LLCs, NMT and ALT, have a principal in common by the name of Abu Mirda. We don't know of any other tie between the two LLCs other than they had a principal in common. It's unclear whether or not the county would ever lawfully be able to recover the lien at 7822 Davis, and it's unsure whether or not the lien ever attached to the Beverly Parkway property simply because the principal was in common. The previous owner, NMT LLC, is now offering to pay the hard costs in order to release the lien from both of these properties so that they have clear title and can proceed with whatever it is they intend to do. And I hope that is as clear as I can make it. It's a little bit more convoluted than usual. And I see Mr. Hoffman is here. Yep. Tim, you wanna go ahead? It, the, the only thing I'd like to add is uh, they're proposing to pay 3206. Um, this case predates the board action uh, where they reduced hard costs that began on May 7th, 2008. This is a 2006 case. Um, so their hard costs total uh, minus clerk fees would be 4306. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rogers, you did a very good job summar summarizing what the issue is. I think the one piece that I'd like to highlight is when that special magistrate proceeding went through, they were not given notice. When they purchased the property, and I'm referring to the one, the 7822, North Davis, they were not aware of that issue. It only came up after the fact. So I do agree. I, I don't think the county's ever gonna be in a, in a position to foreclose it. However, it is creating a cloud on title. And given the $75,000 fine, um, it's quite substantial. Uh, the principles of both ALT and NMT are longstanding uh, members of the community. They've been 
operating business for quite some time. So we're trying to get that issue resolved. And um, right now what we're proposing, I believe our initial proposal was to pay the, the fine amount, which was 3,800. He just clarified that that amount is about 4,300. I think there'd be a, an argument for my clients to say, hey, we shouldn't have to pay anything. But what they wanted to do today was to come forward with a proposal that was very fair and say, really all the hard costs the county paid, we're willing to go ahead and pay those. And right now, if they didn't do that, I don't think the county would ever get that money. But for that $75,000, which was just more or less a civil penalty that they had no notice of until long after it had been abated. And for the entire time they've owned the property, they have been um, keeping it in compliance. So I think it's a win-win for both the county and for our client, and it, it allows what otherwise is going to sit there indefinitely as a cloud on title to remain. Prior, are you saying that when they purchased it, it was already in, it was already, like I said, a case was already open on it? it Correct. Well, essentially, they, that order had already been entered and recorded. They bought the property, not aware of it. After the fact, it then it found its way into a title search report. And part of the reason why, for the same thing Ms. Rogers explained, you've got similar principles, you've got a code enforcement lien that may or may not be enforceable. When the title underwriters come up with a search report, they're not coming up with every lien that can be enforced. They're coming up where, with sometimes, as in this case, this is a potential problem. We're not sure exactly whether it is or is not enforceable. It's a cloud. So we're really trying to get that cloud released. And um, part of that request would be, we would be paying that 4,200, 4,300 in hard cost to the county, and then just requesting that the 75,000 civil penalty be released. And one, once that's done, both of the properties that are being affected by that would, um, would have their problem resolved. The title company wouldn't be responsible for that? I mean, They're not gonna be willing to assume that risk. That's why he's here. Correct. The, the, the title, well, I mean, they gave them a clear title, though, whether they are willing to assume it or you not. See these, you see these all the time where they're get, you're getting the ask because the title companies would prefer not to assume the risk if they don't have to, if they can get the board to take action that. It's original purchase. You're talking about original purchase. Right. It's talking about oh. claim against the previous title. Yeah, the title, they gave them a clear, when someone bought the property, they gave them a clear title. Yeah, and potentially. There was, still, there was still was a lien on a property that they gave them a clear title to. I mean, that's why you buy title insurance, correct? Sure. In theory, yes, absolutely. I, I will represent I they attempted to go that route, and they have not gotten any relief. Right. So I understand oh, okay. the general perception of what title insurance right. does. In this particular one, the problem is it's not an enforceable lien. Right, does it change the fact that that creates a cloud? If you're a new buyer buying something and you got something, maybe it's enforceable, maybe it's not, it creates a cloud. That's where the problem is. That's where the harm is to the, to the citizens. And in this case, you know, we're talking about the, the $75,000 soft fine is really where. The, the Rob, I mean, and, and Brian, obviously I respect everything that, that you do. It's still a little cloudy. I mean, I obviously probably don't see any reason why I couldn't support it. I'd just like to understand it a little more. This is a little confusing. I don't think I'm going to be able to understand it in 45 minutes. Uh, but I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want to deny it at all. Robert, I'll follow your lead. I'd like to maybe bring it back and have a clear understanding. It is waiving $75,000, but I'd like to at least have a clear understanding so there's no real precedent that we're setting that we can't live with. But I, I'm willing to do whatever you want to do since it partners your district. Hey, uh, Tim. I didn't see any of the notes from, I didn't see any of the notes from um, code enforcement in there, but has the. Um, it was abated even before they bought it, correct? It was remedied before they bought it. Yeah, I mean, it was it. abated in the process. So. Yeah, these owners, I wouldn't think, when they bought it, it was in compliance, and it's correct or not. Which yeah. correct. Yeah, that's what, yeah that's it's, I'm, I'm looking back because of there being several owners and depending yeah. on how you And that's the only reason I want to take a, another look at it, Robert. And yeah. We're not going to get it. It'd be hard to get it in 45 minutes. I think that, I think we, I think you'd find support, Brian. I think we just need a little time. Okay. Um, and, and then Tim, we're, we don't have any issues in the, in the years that they've, they've held it. I mean, I think they ended up, I mean, that's a fairly new Exxon up at 78.22, isn't it? Is that fairly new, I guess? Uh, um, it, it, it's, I haven't checked. I know my staff has gone and inspected the properties and they were compliant before this request became, okay. came before the board. When was the last time you were out? 
What's that? Excuse me, I'm sorry. I apologize. When was the last time you were out? It, it's they were out within the past couple of weeks. Can I mean, at least what's known in the special magistrate report, it's referring to trash and debris and basically cutting the grass. Right. So are, they did not know when they when they bought the property that wasn't there. And to answer your question about the seventy-five thousand, it's a valid point. But the, the the question is the party that's now being burdened with the problem. They weren't the one creating it. They had no uh, constructive notice of any kind when that thing went through because they weren't part of the special magistrate proceeding. If they were, I think they'd have gone in there and said, hey, we, we can fix this up and get it mowed. But what happened is they came in after the fact, and now th there has been no problem that's occurred since. So I do not think you're in any danger of setting a precedent where people are going to walk away from $75,000 bills owed to the county. Yeah, Commissioner May, and, and from what I've, my discussions with the attorney, it, it seems that they were given a week to abate, and it went to a $500, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. but both which seem a little. Yeah, I mean, excessive. yeah, I just want to just work through it. I mean, I, 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 that number seems excessive to me. Well, I mean, and, yeah. and one thing I think, I don't know because I wasn't at that special magistrate meeting, but most of the time when you get per day penalties like that, there wasn't anyone there. <laughs> if someone had been there and said, hey, we're, we're trying to get some explanation on we're getting this resolved, but no one was there. So I think that if the county, if the cost they if we're put gonna out to, to cut those right. trees down right. and get the grass, yeah, if that's right. replenished, then I think letting essentially property owners that are completely innocent of that go is a, is a, is a fair precedent to set. If it's, not scientific, if it's not time sensitive, Brian, I mean, we're going to hopefully waive those soft costs. So if we bring it back next week, it's not going to be any more cost to them. I mean, they're agreeing to pay the hard costs. Hard costs are going to be the hard cost when we bring it back. And I think we'll certainly have a good understanding in making sure that there's no precedent or anything else out there. Sure. I mean, so All that's right. what we'll get with you today and let you know. Okay. Right. Should I plan on coming to the meeting tonight or is it? Mm -hmm. Can you can we just do it on the nineteenth then, Brian? If you don't do, mind, do it when? can you just come on the nineteenth? Uh, th that th we can do that then. Okay. Morning, morning of the nineteenth. Morning of the nineteenth. Morning of the nineteenth. Okay. Thanks, Thank Brian. you. Okay. Good seeing you again. All right. Uh, did the clerk's office re receive the proofs of publication? Mr. Chairman, the clerk's office has received all proofs. Okay. Um. All right. We have a number of public hearings. Do we need anyone? Need to discuss any of these this morning? No, I think we're going to have uh, quite, we'll have quite a few speakers tonight. Mr. Yeah, we got well, we've got our public hearings, and then um, uh, we do have the uh, the list of the um, uh, NRA Island, and I think there's another item later on in the agenda on that. So, uh, clerk's report. Thank you. I have four items on the agenda. The first one is recommendation concerning acceptance of the June 2021 investment report. The second is a concerning a notice of intent by the clerk's office to initiate foreclosure for unclaimed monies. This is required by the state. The third is recommendation concerning documents filed um, with the minutes. And the fourth is recommendation about minutes and reports prepared by the clerk's office. Thank you. Most Thank of you. it is routine. Sure. Uh, growth management. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners, Board members. Uh, we have we have several agenda items for tonight. Several public hearings. The first public hearing is the rezoning case Z twenty twenty one dash zero five. Then we have the five forty five. That's the official document of the zoning maps. We have Ms. the five. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. Um, you kind of glossed over the vacations portion. Yep. Okay. Do Do we have any reason to believe that any of these that any of these are going to be objected to? The one on Jocelyn Road staff objects to it. Okay, we know that. So we're going to pull that one back. That's in District One. Uh, other than the one that was being dropped, I'm sorry. Other that's the one that is being dropped, right? No, no. It's oh, on the okay. Agenda. All right. Do we have any? Do we have any? Any? Reason to believe we have public pushback about any of the vacations like we get sometimes? No. Okay. No. All right. Just curious. Okay. Yeah. No. I think the the one that was dropped is the 555 item 11 under under growth management. Is that the one that you're talking about? That was starts off the the board of county commissioners dropped the 555 for the. Okay. No. I'm sorry. When Jeff spoke a second ago about staff, I thought I thought he also said that that it was being dropped. But oh, okay. No. Okay. All right, horse. 
Then we have the 545, the official, the adoption of the official zoning map. We have the 546. This is a, it's going to take a, a quasi judicial plan unit development. Yes, just as a reminder, uh, this is an amendment to a previously approved PUD. It is quasi judicial. There will be a brief script for the chairperson, and there is a specific motion. It does have multiple parts to it uh, that will be distributed to you guys this evening. And the planning board looked at this, Horace? Yes, it did. And they approved the additional yes, lot. It's one additional lot in a subdivision, right? Yes. Is he allowed to say that? He, yeah, it, it, it is based, the, the underlying request is to add, amend the approved PUD by adding one additional lot to the, uh, to the PUD. And the planning board did approve that? And it's coming okay. to you approved by the planning okay. board. Can we ask questions about it now? Or is it, it really needs to wait till tonight because okay. it's quasi-judicial. It's more like a rezoning than a... Okay. And and at the 547, this is the first of two public hearings um, um, for the review of amending the real mixed use um, to increase retail sales area through the conditional use process. Again, first of two public hearings. 540, uh, the 548 is a public hearing for a renewal of short leaf borrow pit resource extraction for a renewal. The, 540, the 550. Again, it's a permit for a renewal of Surrey Pit, Eight Mile Creek Borough Pit, 551. It's the same. It's a renewal permit for resource extraction for Triple L Farm Borough Pit. 542 is for, again, another borough pit to renewal resource extraction, Bankhead Drive. Uh, 553, this is... Again, a, 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 another borrow pit renewal for Pensacola Sand Mine Resource Extraction, 554. This is not a borrow pit. This is for a recycling yard trash vegetation debris for eager beaver. Eager beaver. Yard trash recycling vegetation. This is for a renewal permit again. 555. This is the one that we're asking to be dropped at this time because we did receive some information from um, from the. Oh, that's when we had the came. buffer. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we were able to verify. Yes, so we sir. want to so add that in. So we got in. information late. Yep. So we're asking to drop this item. Five fifty six. This is the private property rights. You have two options. And for option A and option B. Court, may I? Yeah. Uh, horse, uh, you know, I, I received an email from Frank and Elizabeth Westmark on this and, uh, you know, good people and I respect them and, and the amount of uh, headaches and heartaches they went through trying to get their property uh, sorted out of that uh, of that sector plan. So, but what they wrote, um, I just want to kind of bounce it off you. They said that the, the language that they think is, and it makes sense to me too, it just seems very protective of a person's rights, um, is the same language that was in our codes in 2000 and 2010 about, and it's, it's language that comes straight out of statute, and, I, and my understanding from the email I got from them is that it comports with the state's property owner's bill of rights statute. Um, and it just, if you have, it, I think one of the things that it says is if you have an issue and it has to be settled, it has to be settled judicially instead of administratively. It just seems like an extra layer of protection for property owners that I tend to support. Um, tell me your thoughts on, on why we wouldn't go with that language that we had before in 2000 and 2010. Um, if my memory served me correctly, because asked me again, the time machine back then, um, there, was some, there was some understanding that to remove all extraneous extra information because as you know, and Allison, please correct me, uh, private property rights, there's a plethora of, of case law yes. and takings that was that's currently in place. And so at the time, it was, well, if, it's not, if it's not really, really needed to remove it because of the plethora of information that's already governed by the Constitution as well. So, so, so and at this time, the, the, the state legislation, they decided to put a model ordinance mm -hmm. in it and at the planning board, there were some discussions. This is my concern. I do not, this was last minute, this last minute change, it was a last minute item mm -hmm. that, that was bought to the planning board. Uh, staff did not have the opportunity to review it. 
Okay. And, and I'm, I'm concerning, I'm, my concern is this. I do not want it to have unintended consequences. Sure. But, but item option A was the model ordinance that mm -hmm. was adopted, that was reviewed and approved by the state legislature that we have to get it into our comprehensive plan as a mandatory. Okay. Um, the, the previous language that I think that the Westmarks would like to see us continue with, obviously that was in, in force in the county for decades, is what it seems like to me, um, according to their timeline, and I have no reason to believe that what they've sent me is not true. Uh, did we run into major problems with that? Does this new language eliminate any kind of problems? I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to work out the reasons why we would take something that appears to have served property owners very well and then remove it. Understanding the state, but I don't always agree with what they do over in Tallahassee. And if we don't have to do, it's very rare we don't have to do exactly what they tell us. And in this particular instance, if we could, if we want to go with option B, are we allowed to under statute yes, legally? It, yes, if that is, if option B is, is it is allowed to, it's the one that the board directs, mm -hmm. you can. Okay, yeah, Drew, you please help me. We have to have. You got to speak in the mic, so for the record. You can add the extra language mm -hmm. in B. Yep. We absolutely, though, have to have what the state has mandated. Sure. So that's no no other. We have to have that. But we can, can always we it. can still add to it. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it, guys. I guess I'll mull it over a little bit. But yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, yeah. Thank you. So um, I listened to part of the planning board meeting. There was some. There was, and I don't know that it got inserted or, or added to what came forward in B, but I just want to make sure that it, that it didn't. There was some conversation about um, the county being on the hook or being liable for changes that would, administrative or uh, uh, judicial changes that would come from um, governments other than ours, whether it's, it's changes that would be made by the state government or by the federal government, the but, but the county would be on the hook for that. And that was talked about, I know, and I just want to make sure that that wasn't, um, that that didn't filter through to anything that we're seeing. Yes, sir. That, that was, that was, that was the first part of the discussion that the, this happened to me, if I can quickly, they had bought both some language from the state comprehensive private properties. And they was advocating that that was the same exact language, language. Well, the that state would be fine with that. I mean, right. I get that, but Absolutely. I'm not going to be fine with that. I'm Absolutely. not going to support that. And we kept, and we continue to to say no. And Kill jumped in and said no. That's completely different from what the county had. So what? So and they went back and they only put in what the county had. Okay, which alludes to no liability that we would have other than our own actions, which those those protections exist. And this is if it's just kind of, you know, if it's just kind of solidifying those or, or you know. Uh, uh, you know, making making it, uh, giving another spot in the code where those private property protections exist. I don't know that there's any harm in that. I mean, the Burt Harris and the takings are also addressed in other parts of the code, so they're there. I would yes, get it. Sir. I just I, I don't want to. I just wanted to make sure we're not going to be. You know, we're certainly liable for our own mistakes. However, I don't want to be liable for other people's other people's mistakes as well. So, so literally everything that we're looking at in B was in the code in yes. 11 or 10 or 11. Okay. Yes, All right. sir. yes it All was. Right. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Okay. Um. Um, so for this next one, Jeff, mm -hmm. um, yes. what about bringing this to a committee of the whole? And, and hear me out. Miss, Mr. Chairman, yep. okay, one, so we went past the, the landfill related to, I'm sorry, the, uh, the pit that's by the landfill. And I know that we're going to include the language about that buffer that the resident spoke about. I, 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 I'm, yes, not sure. yes, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Pat's in the audience or not, but I, I appreciate Pat. Being, oh, there you are. Appreciate you being able to run down what we talked about a couple a couple months ago or a month ago. And you know, it, it's the institutional knowledge is, is valuable, and it was good enough to me that somebody remembered the conversation. That's good enough to me. I was just going to ask that as as part of this. Um, I know we're including that language. Can we also? We're we're having to drop it because it, we did not get the letter. They did eventually provide the letter, which they found from 2006, right. um, but they didn't get it in in time and yes. so before the agenda was prepared. Okay. So that, this is actually to drop this item yes. tonight. Okay. Um, when the, when this comes it. back, even though it's going to have language in there about that buffer, can mm -hmm. we also attach that letter as yes. the rationale for that language? Sure. Because what I don't want to do is I, I don't want to have language for this permit that has this buffer 
without um, without a direct correlation to why this buffering language is being put in the permit mm -hmm. so that it's not a standard that all the permits are going to have this type of buffering language if we can attach that letter to the permit that this this is something the county previously agreed to this is the reason why this is this buffering language because I, even if we include the language but don't include the the rationale then I'd be afraid that there would be a perception that that's the standard language this you know John Doe is getting a buffering from the pit and um, every pit should have this sure. should have these same entitlements and I just want to make sure we put that letter with it that's all sure Thank you. Um, so uh, Jeff I was saying for this um, what about committee of the whole because um, I know you've had a lot of discussions with staff mm -hmm. and and these some come from that and um, I know I made the comments when we were scheduling this and I'm still about the same but it, it's it's changed a little bit for the reasoning why and and I think it's it's for the same thing that you want though um, so a, as it, the maps are right now you know the idea is that we put a town center there right and and uh, right and the area that's MUU based on the zoning they don't have to put any any commercial in right it can be 100% residential and and so I think that's that may not be what the people want either uh, you know that that the the small town center where you have the commercial on the on the bottom and so is there a way that we can either create another zone uh, zoning that would allow for a maybe 2575 in some of those areas so that we do preserve the intent of trying to have you know dry cleaners and and little stores and and things like that in more of the um on more of the property uh and so because you know the the commercial flu mm -hmm. is um allows for those allows but it has to be 51 percent commercial 49 percent residential correct um and you know i think not only that but given the fact that the change in the in the flu having to go to tallahassee i mean i understand why you want to do that but i think now that that process has been diminished mm -hmm. uh and so it's it's not as uh i don't want to say a hoop rigorous yeah. it's not as rigorous and and so um you know i would want to make sure that the intent of this board um to to have the amenities to have the the shops to have the stores mm -hmm. uh is preserved and yeah. i think in the muu uh area mm -hmm. it, it's not it, I mean, they could build a, a four-story, 100% residential area. Well, that, that's exactly the reason why the strategy that we've taken when, and I appreciate this, and let's, let's have a conversation right now because it's, it's important that we have this conversation. I look at today's vote as probably the most critical vote in more than a decade on this project. We've got the master plan. It was very contentious coming to a compromise. Um, no one's happy. That means you probably hit it, right? I mean, no one's happy. There are people in Beulah that want to put a hit out on me. Um, and there are people in Beulah that are mad at me because there's going to be even one residential. Um, so uh, today, today's vote is very important, and it's, it's really time sensitive, Robert, too. I mean, we, we kicked it a month because what we saw when we put the map up last time was this gigantic sea of yellow, mixed-use urban, which, which does allow much of the commerce and, and the sorts of things that we want to do for job creation. But like you said, it also allows for high density, high impact residential apartment con uh, uh, construction. So, you know, I, I think I, I wasn't alone in the thought that it, you know, they had it backwards. It should be more red, and then those limited areas where we've compromised for the town center and the high density residential. Because make no mistake about it, Robert, what people want and what is the most valuable out there is the ability to build high density residential. That's how. That's how developers make a buck real quick. Sure. And believe me, I've seen it out there, lived out there 17 years. The minute they get that ability, bang, it's amazing how quick they can put up a four-story building and make a lot of money and turn a buck. So uh, the reason I think it's important that we stick with what we have here is, number one, it comports completely with the compromise that we all forged together with DPC, Navy Federal, the group of Beulah folks, the citizens, um, and folks like me that want job creation, um, Florida West. We all, you know, there are a lot of people working uh, you know, behind the scenes, and this allows for elements of all of those things to be present. But what it protects against is the, the you know, this idea that, okay, we didn't fill this one area that's, that's, that's not, you know, that's for commerce, but we, we, we weren't able to fill it. So, but because the underlying flu is mixed-use urban, we can locally 
change that, the local uh, zoning designation, and presto changeo, you've got an apartment complex again. As it is, Robert, when we do this, the, the real estate that's gonna sell the quickest and be developed first is going to be this 20 acres of, uh, of, of, of land that, that allows 60 units per acre to be built. Um, so I think the way we've done it, we've worked very closely with these guys and with DPZ, um, and they're not happy, and no one's happy, I'm not happy, but we've got to move this thing forward. It's been multiple decades, and you know, I, I prefer not to, to workshop it anymore. Um, I think if you read the backup, it's 900 pages. It's extreme, and I, I've gotta give DPZ credit right here on the record. When you read their portion that talks about the design elements that have to be present in each of the Z district Z1, Z2, I mean, it is particular. And it's not going to be easy for people to build out there. They're, it's going to be very expensive. But they're going to make money, so they will do it. But that's the value in, in having a firm like DPZ out there because it's very specific. Even the commercial stuff, the way you've got to put the parking, the way you have to shield it. Um, I think the average citizen, if they take the time to read that 900-page backup, is going to feel pretty good about it. But I do think, um, in hearing from my counterpart, Stephen, you know, when we saw just a very tiny little strip of commercial up front and then all this sea of yellow, it didn't comport with what we talked about. It really didn't comport with compromise. I think what we've got here, and we've hashed it out with Horace and Drew and John Fisher, um, is something that works for everyone. And it, it upholds the spirit of compromise. Sure. It prioritizes commerce while allowing mixed use, residential, parks, public facilities, um, and all these other sorts of things. And I think it's time for us to start fishing. We've been cutting bait for decades on this project. We're in the whole 14 million on this project. The, the quicker we get this thing done and we can start selling this property, the quicker we realize those profits and we can put them back into our districts. So I, I don't need to workshop it again um, in order to know that, that we've hit the sweet spot. Well, and I don't disagree with, with some of what you said, but I, I mean, on the other hand, is it, um, you know, how are we gonna do it going forward? I mean, it's, I don't, I don't think that uh, a month is necessarily going to, to to really change it that much. Um, I mean, we, this is our chance to get it right. And I, I believe we've, we've done I'm that speaking, with, with thank this. You. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and so, um, you know, I, again, do we want the town center on that side? I mean, listen, I agreed with you guys mm -hmm. in that you brought the red down. I agree with that. Okay. And, and uh, you know, again, that I, I agree. Well, what are you looking to do? Tell me what you're looking to do. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that, that the, the yellow part mm -hmm. actually has some of the commerce that, that the people want out there, that, that it's not, four stories of, of residential. Okay. And, and I also think that, I don't think there, I mean, is there really any way that they could get 60 units on an acre at, with a cap of four stories? I, I mean, I mean, the likelihood of that actually happening, you know, I mean, we're, we're doing that on the beach and I think we've got like 13 stories, mm -hmm. you know, of a hotel. Very small units. They'd be very, very small sure. units. Um, and so, um, well, can we put a map up and let's talk, because this is, per, this is a good discussion. Steven, are you, are you cool with this? Yeah, let's do this right now. Can we put a map of the future land use as it's contemplated for today's vote? And then can we overlay it with the zoning designations? Let's, I want to get to what you're talking about because we might not be far apart in our positions here, Robert. I mean, I hope that's... I, I, don't, I don't think we are. I'm, I'm okay. trying to, to... You're trying to prevent apartments. Yes. Then I'm with you. Let's go. Let's talk. And, and that's, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm, but, I'll, but on that's, the other that's hand... That's the money. The, here's the problem. But I'm, I'm, the trying, money. I'm trying to find that sweet spot where it doesn't maybe have to be 51%, mm -hmm. but it can't be 0%. Well, you know, I mean, you look at like what's across the street and you have the, the bottom layer is is commercial mm -hmm. and, and retail and then the, the next three are, are residential. OK, I could do that. OK, in looking at this. Um, so right now, if you look at the red outline that kind of runs through uh, the zoning designations, yep. the red outline outlines the commercial yep. uh, future land use, which I think is incredibly important. That saves that frontage along Nine Mile Road, the majority of it, not all of it, but the majority of it for retail uh, amenities, things of this nature, because pr previously that was all yellow, which would have allowed the four-story high-density, high-impact residential. If we keep the commercial right there, they cannot do it. They can only do it as a secondary use up to 49%. And believe me, we went through this on Pine Forest Road. It makes it incredibly difficult for the developers to do it. Now, is it, is it, does it devalue the land a little bit? Maybe. Maybe P.F. Chang's would pay the same amount for a two or three acre part of that frontage as the guy who wants to build 50 apartments. But I know this, if it's, if it's a small difference in price, the community would much rather not see apartments there. They'd much rather see amenities and shops. 
Commissioner, not yes, sir. To, and I realize no, I, don't, jump in, I, I want you all to go back and forth. I'm, I'm fine just kind of waiting to see where you all land. But um, in, in my opinion, um, the person that's developed and, you know, I mean, we all we all have our relationships and we interact with, you know, interact with our own people. Mm -hmm. um, I do interact with some of those folks and have some of those relationships, uh, you know, are longstanding. Mm -hmm. um, they actually are not going to pay that premium for the retail because from their point of view, um, and I, well, I can push a, a perfect example that's on the ground right now on mm -hmm. Nine Mile, on the south side of Nine Mile, in between Ashland and where Stefani dead ends into Nine Mile. We've got uh, apartments that are just 100 yards, 150 yards off Nine Mile. I've seen them. Um, and they, they retained the frontage. You know, former commissioner had, you know, quite a bit of that acreage there. Um, they sold off that portion for the, for the apartments. Once the apartments were completed, full, that kind of thing. Then they brought the retail in uh, to kind of fill in the frontage there uh, along Nine Mile. The apartments, there's not much, at least what I'm told, there's not much of a strategic advantage to them being literally on the frontage if they're 100 yards off. They're not going to pay, based, based on conversation, they're not going to pay that additional excise tax to be on Nine Mile that we would want from um, from those from those commercial or that we would get from those so I'm not necessarily saying they wouldn't pay more to be on, more than a PF Chang's I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. saying that because of their density and their business model they still would pay more mm -hmm. but they're not going to pay more to us to be on nine mile than they are to be 150 yards exactly. off exactly so that's phew. that's that's based on a lot of conversations so if you know and I'm not sure if this is what Commissioner Bender is saying or not but if if some of this conversation is maybe wanting to extend that commercial portion even further west on Nine Mile, I'm all I'm all you know, about it. You know, this I'm very you know I'm very supportive of that. I mean, I uh, you know so okay, okay, if well, that's that, where if that's where part of this lands, it, then I mean, you're making my day, Stephen. I well, see. We can't have these conversations. I, I know, and that's why I'm asking for a for a committee of the whole because yes, it would be to move it further to the to the west, but it may not be at 5149. You know, percent. That hasn't been the the fifty one forty nine. I, you know, as we've talked about. I mean, th this this ends up being you know ends up being a negotiated or you know uh, compromise of sorts. But what ends up happening? I mean, you know, if we take the action tonight and and do the business, and then we decide we want to change something, we could always change. Then it. we change it. So. You know the 5149. I mean, I haven't ever loved that necessarily, but it, it's it's okay. I feel you know I feel comfortable that if something happens, that our board will have the appetite to take the discussion up, and I feel comfortable at at you know at, at my ability, my colleagues' ability to to articulate what the need for a change might would be, and yes. to successfully get that done if we need to. So if you know, and I'll let y'all go, kind of go back and forth again. It, whatever you, whatever y'all can end up being good with, I'm okay with. It, it, it's, I know that when it comes down to it, we're going to control what happens on that property. Yes, we are. So, yes, we are. whether it happens tonight or you sure. know, when, whenever, that's going to we're, we're we're going to be what who controls what happens I, there. I mean, so so I mean, honestly, my my concern would be is that you you put a a high commercial usage component to it, mm -hmm. and given the size. Uh, of all that red Z1, maroon Z1, mm -hmm. is that you can't fill it, right? So now you've got empty storefronts, so you have people losing money, and you know, I mean, they're not building it out. And, and so that's why I, I thought that the, the 5149 was a little heavy. So how would you, you, you say 75, 25, 75 residential, 25 commercial? Is that yes. Right? See, I don't know. I, cause and, and, and I mean, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be the whole thing. I mean, I think as we have it now, there are certain corners that have to have some type of uh, even in the in the the area outside the commercial area, um, in the MUU, mm -hmm. um, right? That there's, they've got to have some commerce uh, retail portion of it, like on the corner and stuff like that. So we we can add little things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I I think a lot of of what we would maybe see is that 25 to 51 percent uh, in the commerce Z1 is also what we're looking at in that finger of Z4. Of the of the commerce, right? Mm -hmm. So those, you know, your doctor offices, your medical billing, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and and so, I I, I want to, um, you know, again, is is that is do we want the town center on the east side? Do we want it on the west side? Do we want it 
uh, closer to the purple MUU um, so that, that those people can walk to it? I mean, right now we put it as, as far down as we can. Well, it was, and I think that was part of the thought process that DPZ gave, you know, to the proximity to a lot of workers at Navy Federal. Um, and I think there was some conscious decisions to, to make it uh, adjoin their their 100 acre strip. But but um, now we're, I mean, this is an interesting conversation. And I guess my question to Drew would be, um, if we changed the designation um, from 5149 to something different, say 7030, or maybe even 6040, what does that entail? Is that a local decision? Or would that be done at the same time with this via the state and the future land use? If it would have to be specific to OLFA. Correct. I wouldn't want to do that for the whole county. Oh, right, yeah. right, um, right. So we'd have to make it part of part of this project. I mean, part of the comp plan text amendment. That's yeah, the amendment, the amendment that we're sending, we would have to kind of put that in there. That's where that additional density, um, you know, 60 yeah. units per acre, because that's nowhere else in the county. It's got to be specific to this amendment. Right. So, so Robert, you're talking about you're talking about where it you have no problem with these boundaries, but you would just like to see anything in the commercial boundary, the ability of them to do up to 75% residential and only 25 instead of, uh, instead of doing 51% commercial and only 49, right? Is that what, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, but I'm also willing to, to move, expand the, the, the red border to the west so that you do have more, because everything along this, this west side that's in the MUU mm -hmm. flu mm -hmm. could be 100% residential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the residents of Beulah wouldn't get any any benefits. They don't have their town center. I mean, their town center would, would be just this one little portion um, that that borders Navy Federal mm -hmm. and and above there. And then we also have the buffer going all the way across for the you know no residential. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, but I, I mean, think, but I, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to expand the town center part of it. Yeah. Right to mm -hmm. where it, it's. You, you have more shops and restaurants and, and so that maybe the PF changes on the bottom floor instead of having to figure out who's gonna take over the second floor so you can build two residential you know, yeah. floors on top of it. Well, and, and, and look, I, I, you know, I'm not necessarily opposed to what you're saying and I, I appreciate the discussion because again, we never get to have these conversations. This is it, this is it right here. Um, but, but I think what Steven said, there's wisdom in what he just said in that you know, we need to show that we're able to close a loop and take action and, and finish something. And if, if the need arises to, to make a, dr a dramatic zoning change like that, I think it's reasonable, Robert, what you're talking about. But I will say it was excruciating coming to this um, outline of the commercial area. It preserves a lot of high density ability. And it also preserves the ability for these folks to have a commercial tenant and a significant component of residential. I mean, nearly 50%, nearly half and half. So, you know, my preference tonight is to move forward, close a loop, and then, you know, get the process going to get, that way we can start moving these properties and then bring a proposal, bring a specific map. I spent last, if you remember last month at this time, at this meeting, last month, we talked about it. I saw what was put up there. I said, no way, it's a non-starter, no chance. And the, you know, the voices of the board was, well, okay, go work with the staff and go do it. I did, and I, I spent a good bit of time doing that. We went back and forth and back and forth. And I think we got it, you know, the porridge is never gonna be just right, right? It's gonna be too hot, it's too cold. It's pretty close to right in the middle and just right right now. And as Stephen just alluded to, we can come back and we can do that later. But we need to get this process going at the state level. We need to show people in the community, look, we can close a loop. We don't kick things down the road forever and study things, but get, uh, commission other studies and then put the studies on the shelf and then we're sitting up here with a boolea. We can't make a choice. I think we close the loop today, Robert, and then bring your specific pro proposal back, just like I did. Right. I, I, I heard saying, that I mean, last month. I did it and I brought it. And this is it. And I really want an up and down vote on this. I'm willing to look at what you've just said. But I think this, this preserves the compromise. It allows for the town center. It, it does everything that we wanted to do. And again, no one's really happy with it. So that means you've hit the sweet spot. Um, but if you want to add uh, you know, the ability for some expanded residential in the commercial, bring that. And I'm, I'll, I'll be open-minded to it. But I want to close a no, loop. I'm talking about expanding the, I'm essentially expanding the commercial. I mean, that, that's what I'm. Well, not really. When you, when you go from 4950, to 75, 25, you're dramatically expanding the residential. That's what you're doing. But I'm also expanding the footprint to the west. And you're expanding the residential. 
but I'm also limiting the fact that they can't do 100% on the, on the west side. Well, well, I mean, that's true. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, so it, 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 it's, it's but then, give but, and take. But here's the problem. Then, then the folks, then you've, you've taken it too far and you've overplayed your hand because the folks that really want the town center, they want some of that high density residential. Remember, you and, I, you and I may not want it, and we didn't, and I don't, but it's part of the compromise. I mean, I so if you do, that, you do that, then they light you up and they say, well, look, you're going back on the compromise, which you would be. I, I don't be. think so, because I mean, I, th I think 75% residential is still pretty, I mean, it, it gives them what they want and, and it yeah. still gives you the, yes. the, the volume to, to do it. Well, um, again, well, then, then again, let's, let's get the, because you're looking at two separate things. We're looking at the future land use. That's what we're looking at today. We get that locked down. All these other things that you're talking about, we can handle at the local level. We can expand, we can change those things at the local level to add the additional residential and some of the commercial, if you'd like to do that. Sure. Because, because the area that you're talking about will be under the mixed use urban future yep. land use. So it's not, what you want to do is not, uh, this doesn't hold up what you want to do, I guess I'll put it that way for you. Um, right. And, and so there's no reason not to close a loop and finish something tonight so sure. we can start moving this forward. And then the other thing I think I would, I would disagree with mm -hmm. is the, uh, the zones uh, for com commercial development um, which, uh, which and one? light industrial. So they have it to where um, you essentially have zone one is the northeast portion, zone two is this Z4 portion okay. of, of the finger, mm -hmm. and it says that zone two cannot be developed until zone one is at 85 or 80, 85% developed. Yeah, and that's, and, that, and that's part of the plan so that you don't have one area get blown up and, and, and really, look, there's a lot I didn't agree with with DPZ, but I'm telling, did you read the backup? It's tremendous, yeah. 900 pages. But, but the thing is, though, it's is well that thought out. You, you've, got different, <laughs> you've got different people that you're, you're trying to get into the, the finger area and along the residential and, and Z1 areas mm -hmm. than you are in the northeast corner. Absolutely. So, yes. so I think it, it, it would actually prohibit uh, whoever we decide to, to run with us, you know, Scott Luth, whoever, of, of marketing this lower level for medical building or whatever versus someone who's light industrial on the on the north side i, I didn't read it that way and if, if staff is aware of something that, that that i mean then then i'm willing to look at it but i i read through it pretty diligently and i i think i think what there is robert is there's an orderly pattern of development laid out in that plan and again i have a lot of <laughs> there there's been a lot of history with the emails flying back and forth and some things that i i think where they did behind our back but i have to give them props and i have to give them credit for the intelligent way they've laid this out, and um, I just don't see that a, I don't see that as a problem. I think it's I think it's intelligent. And the other thing to think about is, what would be a win? This is my district. Lived out here 17 years. What would be the biggest win for the people that live in my district? Think about that. You've heard them come before the podium. A couple of them. The biggest win for them is if it just stayed a big empty field, right? That would be a win. Of course, we all know that's impossible. We've got 18 and a half million or so invested in it. Um, 14 million still outstanding. So it's not going to happen. But doing it orderly in the way that DPZ is laid out in this plan, it gives them a win for a longer period of time. Um, I, I really I don't have an issue with it. Uh, Drew, let, let's walk through this because this is the only time we could talk about this. So Robert's concerned. It, tell him your concern and let's just see if, if what you're saying is true. So my concern Give is... Give me a scenario. All right. So this northeast portion yep. mm -hmm. is area that, that can be, is, is essentially... Uh, something that we've said will be uh, commerce mm -hmm. perpetuity. Sure, but what does that have to do with the future land use? The future. No, what no, you're it, has, it has the. It has the, the. It says that the future land use changes in out years. I know it has to come in front of us, Correct. but it has the different zones. Oh, yeah. Correct. And so it says in order for it, in order for uh, anyone to start developing this this finger that we mm -hmm. put in commercial mm -hmm. that we changed from MUU to commercial mm -hmm. in the Z4 bottom. You can't develop any of that until that portion that up at the top that is commerce and perpetuity mm -hmm. is developed to 80%. Yeah, okay, but wait, but hold, hold on for just one second. That, is that impacted by the future land use or is that a local zoning thing that we control locally? So yes, once we, once we the county, own this, mm -hmm. that, that's going to be an LDC thing. You guys can fine -tune Exactly. It, it has nothing to do with the state. Because and I, I understand that, but, but why are we putting it in there if it's not... Well, I mean, that's, I, that's my point is, is like, why, why say that they can't develop this, that they can't move forward in, 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 in going after a different tenant mm -hmm. than what you'd put in the Northeast portion. 
because it's 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 the orderly organization and development. Of I don't the disagree plan. with that, but, but I'm but, just saying it's. But but the part is, see, you're mixing what we're talking about here, Robert. We're talking about the future land use, and what Drew's trying to tell you here is, the, what we're doing at the state. What you're talking about is a local decision that's going to be handled locally under the LDC. So we put this at the state. A year from now, two years from now, five years from now, you say, hey, look, what are we doing? Let's change around. We can make that decision locally. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're doing at the state. Am I right? It's so, right. What we're okay. talking about right now is getting the future land use yes. set, um, get the plan in there. And then if, because I, I understand completely what you're saying, um, we don't know who the tenants would be to come in there. So we don't know, we can't guarantee a time schedule of a build out of one piece or another. Mm -hmm. um, but that portion being in the land development code is within our purview locally to fine tune. Yes. See? But, but even at the state level, I mean, with the changes to the flu amendments, you don't have to even go to the state anymore to change the flu. I understand that we're getting this started, but right. This is over 58. This is a large scale. I understand so that. It has to this go. is has to go to the state. Yes. But but most of I mean, I mean, most of anything we'd be changing in the future would probably be less than 50. I don't agree with that at all. This is a big parcel. There's 300 acres right there. There's, these are big. I understand that, but I mean, look at what's in Z1. I mean, you're not, you're. I mean, the remaining portion of the Z1 that's not in commercial, or the, the re, or the portion of of the Z1 that's in, in commercial. Both of those are less than 50, right? Yeah, oh, but, but but Robert, yes. if I might, if I might, I yeah. believe you're you're arguing against your own argument. And why do I say that? Because if you're worried about a difficulty in moving something around. We've just disarmed that argument because we said it's going to be in the LDC. We can do it locally. Well, if you're saying, well, the flu process has changed for smaller parcels than 50 acres at the state, so you're arguing against yourself because if that if that's the case and it's a smaller, then it's easy to do. And that's, that way, and that's why so, that's why I'm trying to again, get it right the first time. I, I, well, you're never. There is no getting it right. The, the, what getting it right is getting something started. Getting it right is getting something that works and holds the coalition together. Um, this does that. And any of these other, uh, you know, potential problems down the line that you're talking about, either through the new state process that talks to less than 50 acres or locally through the LDC process, we can overcome locally like Stephen just said. We can vote locally to fix it. I just, I don't want to stall this. It's been decades. We've gone through it. I don't want DPZ around anymore. We're done with them. They've, they've, they've put a good product forward, right? It's very nice. And, and like you said, a lot of it is, you know, it's kind of mushy. We, we think you should have a sign like this. That's fine, whatever. It's, it's, it's a good product, and the way they've laid it out, the orderly development of it, I like it. And if there's things that we don't like, you heard Stephen just say it. At the end of the day, we're going to control it. So in a year from now, if you think, well, we, we should be able to put a tenant in down here in Z4, uh, in the lower part, and not up there, bring it. I'll probably be your cheerleader. I'll say, yeah, let's do it. But in the meantime, that, none of that, none of that should stop us from getting this flu transmitted to the state. This is the first part. This is yes. step one. You're throwing out arguments that, that really have no bearing okay. because, because we can do it locally, like Stephen said. And believe me, we will do it locally. Perfect. So I'd like to move forward tonight. This is a very big vote. Um, Robert, I'm telling you, you bring, me a, you bring me a good proposal, go do 30 days with the staff like I did, and you'll find my support, all right? But I don't want to stall. I want to move this forward so we can start selling these parcels and I can start putting this to work in my district. Perfect. All right. Commissioner Berry. Thank you. I, I hope that um, I hope that from Scott Lewis' point of view that that we're actively trying to court tenants currently. We are right now. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I hope that, and um, you know, and I, I've said this, I've said this a couple times, and you know, when we when we had you know Zoom meetings and stuff, if uh, you know, we just hypothetically, if we took action tonight and you know stamped this and and uh, um, you know kind of closed the book on our on our master plan uh, master planning partnership and and you know. Uh, uh, had that purchase order and closed, you know, closed that contract and, you know, agreed, uh, you know, agreed everything, all the work is done. And uh, um, in two weeks, Scott had a letter of intent from a tenant that wanted 530 acres. Amazon. They'd have the whole thing. For, I mean, they'd have my vote for the, I mean, Absolutely. depending on the, on, the, on the terms of the deal. That's but the reality. the reality, yeah, if, if he had a tenant for everything, that's what we would do. Or that's, that's what I would all things being equal, the deal being a good deal. My point is, all of this could be for naught if that were to happen, and we would just, uh, or I would, you know, support and, you know, try to just have us wipe all this away and say, hey, there you go, here's the keys, you have the whole property, you know, develop 10,000 jobs, how many, uh, you know, how much ever. So, I mean, and that's not to say that's going to happen, and um, not to say there's not value in the conversation that we're having, but just 
knowing the fluidity of the situation, no matter what we do, what is, what is for sure, and I think it's like some other things we've talked about, you know, in the past, and, and you know, it's like our budget, it's like other things that are tools, what I think we can be 100% sure, that is not gonna be what happens on the property. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not going to be the picture that's on the screen. Just, I mean, just like none of, none of the pictures that we that we have in presentations, nothing's ever going to be exactly that way. So, you know, um, um, you know, I, it's it's been, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the contention and the contentious part of the project hasn't been necessarily amongst us or the majority of us. It's you know, it's been external forces and those things. So, you know, we've gotten to this point you know, majority or, or relatively cohesively among, you know, among four out of five of us. And, you know, I'd like for that to continue as much as possible. So, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully that can continue. So. All right. Thank you. All right. Consent agenda. Yes, sir. And then we have our consent agenda for August 19th, as well as for September the 2nd. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, on the county attorney's report, um, I just uh, real quick, I've got Ray Palmer here uh, for item 11, uh, letters of support for Pensacola Sports. Um, just seeing if there are any questions on on that while we're here this morning. No. No. Ray, and I want to thank um, Darren Schaefer for calling me the other morning. Thank you. So we could discuss that. Appreciate you guys. Robert, it's, it's fantastic. I, I, you might have said county attorney's report. I think you meant county administrator's report. Oh, sorry. Technical, but um, yeah, it's fantastic. I was uh, 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 Michael called me this morning. Let me know that uh, that the letter of support had gotten, uh, you know, was being added. That's that's fantastic. I couldn't be more supportive of the project. Uh, um, we uh, uh, took our first uh, first COVID trip with you know with kids and stuff last uh, last week. So was unable to uh, was unable to go and see some of the facilities at Orange Beach, but. You know, look forward to uh, to going over there, and and uh, you know appreciate the fact that you know uh, that Michael and Ray Palmer are both, I believe, acting in the you know they're 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 representing the board interest, acting in uh, acting in our taxpayers' best interest, and it's a fantastic project. And when uh, when it was first mentioned to me a little while back, you know, it's uh, almost unbelievable the possibility, and now it seems like a very high probability, and it's it's one of the most exciting things that's taken place since I've been on the board. Steven. I'll tell you this, it's in your district, Ashton Brosnahan, but all three of my kids played soccer there, and I don't, uh, your children are, are very young, but don't worry, you'll have your extra time at Ashton Brosnahan if they play soccer. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Our, our daughter's been out there a couple seasons, yeah, as, at a very young age, and, you know, our, as the crow flies, our uh, house is 150 yards from it, through the woods, uh -huh. so, um, we, I mean, we hear the, uh, you know, we hear the games out there, especially the big games that are on the big field, you know, and, uh, yeah, and you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't believe how many people are out there playing just, Recreationally on Sunday afternoons and stuff. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a really big deal. And and Michael does a great job out there. And um, and Ray, you know, in this instance has I think done a fantastic job advocating on our uh, on our community's behalf and and getting it to the point where where we have the potential to be able to uh, to close a deal. It's great. Absolutely. Good stuff. Super. Um, okay. Uh, Debbie, do you have anything? Uh, I think we're dropping something from car two. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, if we don't get any more board members back, are we, 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 you think we might break by 11 and I, just take up well, the rest actually, of our business tonight? Yeah, that's what I was okay. thinking. That's why I was asking. I, I, I just want to go ahead. And, I know she said she had something to drop. Mr. Chairman, if I make a suggestion, yes, we sir. all had our thorough reviews, and I want to thank Debbie and staff and, and Amber McClure and, and Debbie, my aide. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a couple of our members who aren't here. So might I suggest that if there's anything in particular, because um, I've gone through this, I know that you have, and I know that Stephen has, um, uh, you know, if anything in particular that we want to talk about in a group other than that, I mean, I, I don't see the value in, in staying. No, I, and that's um, where I was I, I did I did have one add-on before we break. I'd like to just say a couple words about it. Okay. You just tell me when. Uh, about your cantonment? No. No, no, I'm adding on to him. No, I'm talking about my add-on to the county attorney's report. Oh, okay. What do, you, yeah. what do you think about maybe taking that up when we've got, you know, when we've got more of us here? I'm uh, happy to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Debbie, which one needs to be dropped today? Sorry, wrong side. Uh, we are dropping card to 1, 9, 14, and 31. 1, 9, 
14 and 31 are all being dropped. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, one's being held for a separate vote. Oh. Okay. okay. Um, real quick, the, I, uh, Captain Turbin's here. Uh, is there any questions on the dredging for the Lafitte Cove? It's something that we've done before, but there was an issue with the vendor and we had to bring it back. Well, I'm sorry, what was the last one she was dropping? 9, 14, and what was the 31. 31, okay. Uh, the acquisition of property at West Michigan for a retention pond. Um, tell us about Lafitte, though. What, I mean, that's out of the beach, right? Yeah, so it's something that we do, what, yearly? Um, and uh, as the sands migrate, they fill in, and so we, we remove it. Mm -hmm. um, we had some uh, nesting birds come in at, on the area where we were going to put the spoils, and so we had to delay that. And then by the time we delayed it, the contractor that would, he was in the last year of his contract, uh, wasn't able to perform it. Uh, I believe he was getting rid of his equipment. Oh. And so we had to, this is essentially coming back with the, how much, uh, how much more is it going to cost? Uh, it's going up. <laughs> Everything's going up. It's going up. Yeah, but we uh, got to, I mean, I'm certainly going to support that. We need to do yeah, it. Yeah, we need it's to do it. I mean, I mean, it had neighbors email me how they're, they're, can't get their boats out and stuff. So, it's, and, and the part I'd like to just bring up. So what's in front of the board tonight is just to take care of this year's, mm -hmm. um, the, the remainder to get that canal open and functional again. And it's running through the regular procurement process to secure a regular contract for the next future next cycle. years. So yep. this, this is kind of an emergency. Yeah, we got to do it, man. Yeah, yes. do it. We do. Hey, Ms. one question. Now we're talking about the beach. This is kind of an off the topic Mr. subject. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have one question about this, if you don't mind. And then, Robert, do you mind? It's not a business question necessarily. It's a lack of understanding that maybe lack of understanding that the. Good morning, commissioners. Yeah. Good morning. So. The 700 cubic yards seems like a lot. I mean, is that, is it always that much? I mean, is there, is there something that, I don't know, has, has something that's gone on the island, I don't know enough about the, the sediment moving under the current and stuff, is there something going on that makes, that's making more sediment that needs to be dredged or is it less sediment than it was before? Or? Typically, annually, there's around 1,200 cubic yards. The, the delay of the project has created more of a buildup of sediment. The sediment moves through in a relatively constant rate, except for storms and weather events that can accelerate or decelerate that accumulation. But we're essentially right now trying to make up for two dredged events. So like the hurricane last year, that it, does the movement of that, does that pull a lot more sediment? Is that how that, like environmentally how it works? Yes, sir. Depending okay. on the prevailing wind conditions and, and uh, each storm has a different uh, uh, impact upon that near shore sediment. So it, this, this is really two dredging events combined into one. Okay. We're just delayed quite a bit. Okay. Um, Steve, right. did you say 700,000? 700 cubic yards. Okay, man. yeah. Okay. That seems like said, a lot. I said 100,000, so that's why I was like, no, no, it's, <laughs> that's like the whole. I mean, that's still 80, 80 full dump trucks. Of, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, as, again, as a layperson, it seems like a lot, but, you know, or, or especially if it's a very regular occurrence, which it seems like it is, but if there's, uh, I mean, if that's just science, I mean, I get it. Okay, all right, Jeff. So. Yep. Yes, sir, if I may, in the backup, uh, the memo that uh, is in the backup has a photograph that I show where that uh, sediment is and, and how much it's really impacting that channel. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Robert, the question I was gonna ask you was, um, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, no, this, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Robert. Robert, this Robert. Um, so back to the, the toll booth, we were talking about the collections and stuff and I had a, a question. So if you're in a rent-a-car and here temporarily and you go over, how do they, are, we, are the rent-a-car companies paying because like for instance if i rent the car on the the fifth of the month and i drive to the beach twice and then i turn it in i know they're billing on a cycle so how is that shaken out they, I mean, they get i mean the rental they, car companies come after you after oh okay so so i pay for my rental and then a month later they get it and then are they able to charge my charge i mean how is that working out in practice do you have any idea is that how I, it's working i, I just did it Okay. Yeah. Because I had someone ask me that. And I'm like, man, I have no. Can you prepay for one trip? Like, I want to go. So, so what I did was I had. Uh, so, for instance, I was just in Orlando for the MPOAC, mm -hmm. and I had a rental car. I took my toll tag with me. Mm -hmm. I added the rental car to the to my account. It deducted the oh, the okay. tolls as I went through, 
-hmm. And then I promptly left my toll tag in the rental car. So um, <laughs> you didn't mean to do that. Which which they then racked up four dollars in tolls before I could <laughs> could turn it off. And so um, you know now that we have Easy Pass, that's like I don't know thirty something states. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean. It, it, more people can do that. Uh, again, it was it was very easy. I got to the rental car. I just I just w logged into SunPass and, well, and added the uh, added the license plate. Well, well the que the question I have specifically is like there's a lot of folks that come here on say military travel. We got a lot of military bases. They come here, you know, maybe in the middle of the month they get a rent a car as part of their temporary duty here. They go to the base, uh, then they go out to the beach, then they go then they end up going back to wherever they're from. And who ends up picking up the check? I mean, does it create problems for the the Navy or the company or whoever. Uh, I mean, the rental car, I, I think you're responsible as you would if you ran a red light ticket. Yeah. Uh, the rental car is going to see who had the car when, when it was photo enforced and, mm -hmm. and is going to come after you for the, okay. for the charges. Yeah. Well, like I said, is there, is there an easy way for like a one, a one off trip or something for someone who's only going to be here for a weekend for for example, in a rent a car? Um, Again, that's up to the rental cars if they put in the toll tag. I mean, I know I have when I've gone to Chicago, I can I can pull out the toll tag from the little mm -hmm. iron box, mm -hmm. and if I get charged, then they charge me a little extra fee to do it. And Even I, after I, you've settled your bill. Yep. Okay. And so they they charge me the toll fee plus a little extra to to do it. So. No, I think it's it, and I'll tell you, I've been going out there a lot, and it is much better now the way we're doing it. I mean, it's so much better. The traffic's moving. That hot right turn. To Fort Pickens, a lot of there was a lot of naysayers. Let me just give you some props here, Robert. You were uh, you were uh, I guess a leader on that project, and even I was a little skeptical. That thing makes a huge difference because I make a lot of right turns on <laughs> Fort Pickens Road, and I leave a lot of people in in yeah, line there. Yeah. <laughs> well, eight hundred feet of right turn lane, but we also That's awesome. we had another twenty two thousand car day uh, two weeks ago. Um, that was a Saturday, and then we had a twenty-one thousand the next day on a Sunday, and and uh, you know, it's working. It's working. So I appreciate that. All right. Without any other comments, uh, we'll see you tonight. All right. Thank you.